Well, I am so excited for us to con continue on today as we are in this incredible study that we are calling Stand Firm or Fast in the Lord. The Word of God, the Scriptures, or the Bible, as I love Billy Graham used to refer to it, is so crucially important for us in this incredible conflict that we are involved or engaged in, or so crucial in us standing firm. And as we've been making our way through the full armor of God, I've been so amazed at how everything is just integrated together. And it wasn't until this morning that as we were praying that I thought about the belt of truth, which I'll remind us of, which goes around our waist, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, is attached to that. Isn't that amazing? Just so many new things that God will always illumine us to. And the revelation of God, the statement of faith we have here at Fellowship Chapel, I wanted just to, to read it. It's uh, one that you'll see uh, maybe expounded in some places, shortened in others. But we simply put this. We believe that the Bible, consisting of 66 books of the Old and New Testaments, is the written revelation of God to mankind, is verbally and fully inspired by Him, is sufficient, crucial, crucial word, as a repository of the knowledge of God and of His will that is necessary for the eternal welfare of mankind, is infallible and inerrant in the original manuscripts, and is the supreme and final authority for all Christian faith and conduct. I've always loved how Charlie has expressed that not only did God give us his revelation, but there's been a preservation of it through all of the years. But also integrated so, so important with the revelation of God's word is our interpretation of it. We really believe that we're absolutely dependent upon the illumination, and Charlie prayed it this morning downstairs, the illumination that the Holy Spirit gives us in regards to the Word of God. And how we uh, choose to interpret it is, I believe, crucially important, literally or n normal, as, as people will call it, uh, grammatical, historical, contextual, and I like to say Christological. It's crucially important. There's different ways people will approach the Scriptures. But for us, that is the way. And we believe that that leads us to an application of the Word of God. That we choose to believe and live by faith in what God has revealed to us in His Word. I had mentioned before, if you take the revelation of God's Word, if you have a bad methodology of interpreting it, it's going to lead you to a bad application. But when you put those things together, the transforming truth for us, the influence and the impact on those around us is really immeasurable. And one of the verses that just so come to my heart is the one that I've sort of repeated over and over and over and over and over and over and over again this past year, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, to trust in the Lord with all your heart. And integrated with that trust is who He's revealed Himself to be and the Word of God. Lean not to your own understanding. How many times maybe do you not understand or does it maybe not align with what he has revealed, that happens. But we trust in him. We don't lean to our own understanding. And he's promised he will direct our paths. I just want to stand before you today as I rode and say, I had no understanding of what was going on a year ago. And I still don't understand a lot of things. But I have trusted the Lord. We have trusted the Lord. 
And beloved ones, I hope you sense the same thing I do. He has done exceedingly abundantly above anything I could have ever thought, imagined, or dreamed. And he is continuing to do that in incredible ways. And it's such a testimony to his faithfulness, but I believe it's a testimony to the response of people who will not trust in chariots and horses, but trust in the Lord their God supremely. So with that introduction, I want to invite you to go with me in the New Testament scriptures in whatever form you would choose to the epistle of Paul to the Ephesians, and in particular, again, to Ephesians 6.10. And we are going in our timely, powerful mini-series that's thematic and expositional to continue what we are calling Stand Firm in the Lord. And I have so looked forward to uh, this time together, particularly as I have seen how all of this armament of God integrates and in some ways to me seems to build upon the other and how each one is so crucially important. And as we do come, we would, as we always do, just ask God's richest blessing on the illumination of his revelation through our interpretation that we would really make a powerful life transforming choice to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. As we have been making our way through this incredible passage, I wanted to just remind us that uh, the epistle of Paul to the Ephesians, we have broken it down. Uh, first was uh, foundationally the identity of new creations in Christ. So important, the doctrine, our position, who we are in Christ. And then that has moved us on to the ministry of new creations in Jesus Christ. How do we live through Christ by his spirit in accord with his revelation? So important for us to touch those bases. And that's led us to where we are now, to standing firm in the Lord. And Ephesians 6 verses 10 through 18. And if you will, just follow along. And I have chosen to read this passage out of various translations. Today we're going to read it from the New American Standard Bible, one that I know so many of you utilize. Uh, it's an incredible translation. Time-tested, accurate, and clear. And just listen to some of these incredible words and how they integrate with our study. Finally... Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness, in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm, stand firm therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. What an absolutely incredible portion of scripture that God has preserved for us and given to us that is so crucial for us standing firm in the Lord in our days. And we are making just two expository observations. The first one is to be strong in the Lord. 
The second one is to put on the whole armor of God. And we were just making from there two uh, textual thoughts. The first one is the why. And we have spoken about it really is to stand and stand firm. It's military terminology. It's really applying to us spiritually as new creations in Christ. That we are, as we sang, more than conquerors through him because we're in him. We have the high ground. And so important, we are in him and he is in us. And then we have spoken of the what, as we've kind of touched on each of these pieces of armor. And the first one is the belt of truth, so foundational, so important. And the breastplate of righteousness guarding our hearts. And the preparation of the gospel of peace. And then the shield of faith. And maybe some thoughts in your mind may roll around as you see these again. And then last week we considered the helmet of salvation. And I just wanted to give us a couple of highlights or a few highlights uh, here in regards to this piece before we press on. We said that this could be rendered salvation as a helmet. And I wanted just to revisit what we call biblical salvation, the three dimensions or the three phases. I think there's a lot of confusion today in Christianity about this incredible thought. And in one sense, the thought of justification or sanctification or believing in Christ and becoming like Christ, it, it really gets mixed up. And when that happens, it really creates a lot of issues. So what we said is, is that biblical salvation, that first thought of justification is a point. It's a past. One man said we can see salvation in three time zones. The first is the past. It's believing in, and as we celebrate the Lord's table today, we're saved from the penalty of sin. Our destiny is sealed. That is so important. But then there's a second thought, and it's really the process of becoming like Jesus Christ. It's what's going on right now for us. We are saved from the power of sin, and that's what we mentioned. It's, it's incredible to see that. Romans 6, uh, believing what he says about us, reckoning upon the truth, yielding ourselves, presenting ourselves, walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, all those thoughts are there. But there's a coming day in the future of glorification. It's being in the presence of Jesus Christ, saved from the uh, very presence of sin. And what a day that will be. And this incredible thought of the helmet of salvation, it's designed as uh, protection spiritually for us through transformation and the renewal of our mind and us being assured of our salvation, biblical salvation, justification, sanctification, and then the incredible hope we have of glorification. And also, I love to tie in the identification thought that, that those who are in Christ are being led in his triumphant train from victory to victory, and we're making manifest to us the sweet savor of the knowledge of Christ. Isn't that powerful? And when we put these things together, it's amazing. I did want to mention, too, just thinking in the mind before we, we move forward, because it's going to tie in so strong here. 2 Corinthians 10, in verse 3, we've read it a couple of times. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, but the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every, listen, thought into the captivity to the obedience of Christ. So that's 2 Corinthians 10. But then he comes with this thought on the mind in 11 that I didn't mention last week. Paul says this, But I fear 
lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, and remember, this is what we're talking about, deception, disheartment, all those kinds of things that can be brought about spiritually. He says, he's afraid that would happen, but then he says, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Thinking in our mind is so crucial. That is where the battle is involved and engaged in so many ways. And correctly thinking in accordance with the Word of God is so vitally crucial. And I love that thought in 2 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 11, that his fear would be they would be taken away from simplistic devotion to Jesus Christ. It really begins there, just keeping our minds fixed and stayed upon him and everything else just overflows from that point. That's an incredible strategy that the Apostle Paul saw. And that leads us to the very next piece that integrates so powerfully. It's our sixth biblical spotlight. It's the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And very noteworthy, this is our first piece of offensive equipment in this incredible passage of Scripture. The Amplified Version says it this way, the sword of the Spirit, the sword, excuse me, that the Spirit, and I love what it says, wields, which is the Word of God. Also, one translation says, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, or God's Word. And that leads us just to a few historical considerations here in regards to a Roman soldier, a warrior that was prepared to engage the enemy. I wanted to read what Tony Evans says here because it really sets up an incredible way for us to look at this. He says, all the other pieces of armor that we have discussed are primarily defensive in nature. They protect us from harm by minimizing our vulnerabilities and covering our potentially weak areas. But no Roman soldier would ever have wanted to go into battle with only protective gear. They would have had a sword at their side which could be easily used against any combatant coming against them. You see, the Roman warrior or the Roman soldier, he carried a double-edged sword. And this is really important. That sword was used for thrusting, not so much slashing. The sword was about 24 inches long with two inches wide with a parallel size that were both incredibly sharp. Before they had actually, as I said, used a sword to slash, but they discovered that this new shorter sword and its piercing penetrating nature proved to be a much more effective way when they were in close hand-to-hand -hand combat and during that time it seemed as though that any wound could almost be fatal and this short sword was some would say the real power behind the Roman army and their advancement. The sword was always carried on uh, the side of the warrior and it would be in a decorated scabbard. And also this sword was usually attached, as we said, to a belt or possibly worn over their shoulders. When they were used in very close range by a skilled soldier, in hand-to-hand -hand combat, it was just a highly effective weapon. What I have today is one of these swords that is actually Charles Clough's that's on the table here. And 
this is a very good example of, of what that looked like and with it being in that scabbard and with it being worn on the side or across, however it would choose to be. I would, well, maybe I can, but I better step back here. You might be calling the fire hall. Because <laughs> um, this is what it looked like. And the reason I was saying that is this thing is razor sharp on both sides. And it's absolutely amazing to see it. I will prayerfully put it back in here carefully. And if you do want to see it, and it does have Charles's name engraved on it. And uh, it, it is an, an incredible illustration for us to think about as we're going to see the comparison of this as we move towards the Word of God and how it's so amazing that the Apostle Paul and the writers would pick out this incredible offensive weapon in that time. As I mentioned, it was primarily used as an offensive weapon for piercing or for penetrating. It could be used defensively, as you could see if you had it and you needed to block something, but it's primarily an offensive weapon. Warriors would undergo, and this is really an important point too, they would undergo special rigid intense training, instruction in how to utilize the sword and practice with it. So they would become familiar with it and be able to use it in a very skillful way for maximum protection from harm or to attack and overcome an enemy. Uh, Charlie had this book, and it's in conjunction with the sword, which is incredible, just about armament for those guys during this time, and there's a section on that sword. One of the interesting things was, was if you learned to use that sword in a really skillful way and you were really proficient in it, you would get double provisions as a Roman warrior. If you didn't learn to use it and you couldn't use it, not only did you get not your normal provisions, you got less. So that should emphasize to us how important this weapon really was to them and how vitally uh, crucial it was uh, for them. One thought is, is any Roman soldier or warrior would just be absolutely foolish, would they not, to enter into battle, to engage the enemy without this offensive weapon and equipment? And then not only that, to not know how to use it effectively, very easily you could harm yourself without proper practice and use and training in this incredible, incredible piece of equipment. The one thing that I really uh, thought about as we would move a little bit to the present really more has to do with our, our military with offensive weaponry. I, I guess a lot of it's evolved from swords to guns and stun guns and batons. But the one thing I really thought a lot about is pictured here behind me is the military bayonet and the training that men would go through. And when you go back into World War I and World War II, I mean, obviously, a lot of things were different, but that was so crucially important. And being able to utilize the bayonet. Frank, you know, when we've rode up to Gettysburg and we've been up there on the top of Little Round Top. And in the movie um, Gettysburg, I don't know if any of you guys have seen it or how many of you may have seen it. But Jeff Daniels, as he was depicting one of the Union generals, as the Confederate Army was coming up and they basically were running out of ammunition. Does anybody remember what he says in that movie? Can anybody recall? Fix bayonets. 
is the command he gives. And then in the movie, it says all of a sudden you just hear click, 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 click. And it's those guys putting those bayonets onto the ends of their rifles because of that incredible circumstance and that moment in time. And you know they were, they were trained. They were headed into hand-to-hand -hand combat. And the intent there was it was going to be offensive, an attack, but also a degree of defensiveness as well. So that leads us to spiritually our thoughts of us as new creations in Christ, as spiritual warriors, overcomers more than conquerors prepared to stand and to engage the enemy. And just some spiritual insights that I want to give us here as we, we kind of make our way through. Just these few words are just packed with so much meaning. He starts out and Paul says, and take, um, integrating that somewhat with the prior thought of the helmet of salvation. It's accept, receive deliberately and readily the sword of the spirit. It's amazing here that the sword of the spirit in this expression is only found here. And it is a vital part of the spiritual armor that Paul calls the full armor of God for us to take up in order to stand our ground against the evil one. Notice what it says. It's the sword of the spirit. It is a weapon belonging to the spirit, which we have been given as a piece of the full armor of God. And also I want you to note the word of the Spirit. What that does is, is it, it indicates to us that we're involved in what? A spiritual battle, right? There's so many little hints and things here. And the utilization of it in the power of the Holy Spirit is what's crucial. I don't know if any of you guys have ever been beaten over the head with the Bible by somebody somewhere. I have. Is anybody else? I don't know that that was quite a spiritual use as we're looking at, you know. It's crucial, and we're going to see that. We're talking about a piercing. We're talking about the Holy Spirit working through us with the Word of God and it piercing, whether it's our heart or maybe it's a word right in the perfect season for somebody else to strengthen them, to encourage them. Or maybe it's something that would convict someone of sin and righteousness and judgment. But we have to see these things together of the spirit, one man said, refers to the source or the origin of the sword. Hence, it is the sword given by the spirit. The sword of the spirit is specified as the word of God. And I just wanted to give us two really primary thoughts here in relation to the word of God. The first one, I believe you could go and hear all kinds of messages, proclamations, on this passage, but this base would not be touched. Jesus is the living word. To me, that is our starting point. He is our focus. Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, is the eternal living word of God. The second person of the Trinity or the triunity. John 1, verses 1 and 2 say this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. How crucially important. And then John 1, 14, one of my favorite passages on the incarnation of Christ. And what? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory who? Of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. 
Hebrews 1 would say that he is the exact representation of God. That just thrills my soul for us to consider this powerful passage, but considering who Jesus Christ the Word is. If you want to turn to Revelation 19, you can, but verses 11 to 16 is really the final victory at the end of the tribulation, and I wanted to read this because it's, it's absolutely incredible. In Revelation 19, verse 11 says, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. In righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one except himself knew. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called, look, the Word of God. Do you have any question in your mind where this incredible spiritual thing is going to end. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Look at verse 15. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. I don't think the Holy Spirit put that in by accident. His word, powerful, sharp, Piercing, and we'll see that in a moment as well. That with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And on his robe and on his thigh a name written King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Can you say hallelujah with me? Hallelujah. To God be the glory, now and forevermore. Dr. David Jeremiah says he is the living word. Warren Wearsby says in one sense the whole armor of God is a picture of Jesus Christ. He is the word of God. And Paul is telling us here the sword represents the Word of God, the written picture, we could say, of Jesus Christ. He's the living version, one man said, of everything God, had, God wanted to say to mankind. And that leads us to the second thought, the revealed or the written Word of God. When we speak of the word word in relation to the word of God, there's really two words that can be pointed to. One is logos, which is more of a general thought of the whole Bible. The other is rama or rhema, a, a specific, very specified, maybe verse or portion of scripture, a saying of God that has application to a specific situation. That is the word that is used here. Not just a generalistic, but it is, as we said, the, the sword of the Spirit. The Spirit is wielding it, the Word of God, very specifically, very intentionally in circumstances. Have you ever been in a conversation with somebody and just sensed that you should say something to them that was from the Word of God? Anybody ever do that, sense that? I know I have. And I'll tell you, somebody that is ever equipped with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, is Carol Clough. You can't have a conversation with Carol Clough without getting a Bible education of how, Carolyn, I mean that so positive, how the Word of God affects us in any given type of a circumstance and so powerful and so timely and so appropriate. It's so vital that, yes, it can refer to the preached word, but also that specific utterance that's coming through the Holy Spirit 
as we are involved and engaged in standing firm. And I just wanted to, in the light of the full armor of God and Paul calling and imperatively commanding us as new creations in Christ to take up, to take up Christ, the living word, and be armed with the revealed word, the sword of the spirit, the written word of God in dependence upon the spirit of God, just to give us really some correlating scriptures, if you will. There's so many things we could say. But Dr. Jeremiah just so highlights for the new creation in Christ, the word of God is our sword. And just a few of these uh, correlating scriptures. In Matthew 4, verses 4, 7, and 10, we have the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. Listen just to these words real quick. Now, if the Son of Man, who's perfect, is going to utilize the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, in His living, how much more so should we, right? I want to read this passage. I was going to just select those verses, but this morning in preparation, I was so struck. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterward, he was hungry. Now when, notice here, guys, the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Do we recognize when the tempter comes to us to deceive us? to lie to us, to discourage us. The Lord Jesus knew right away. But Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Context, context, context. Verse 5, Then the devil... Amazing, isn't it, these names? The devil took him into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, and I didn't ever see this until this morning, and that's why I wanted to read this text. The first time, Satan just comes to him and saying, if you're the son of God, you know, this command and all this. Notice what Satan does here, you guys. He says, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down, and then what does he do? For it is written. Isn't that amazing? I'd never seen that before. So he saw what Jesus did to him. Now he twists that, right? Out of context, out of everything, just like in the garden. This, is, this really is not rocket scientists to see spiritually what's going on. He is just so deceptive. He shall give his angels charge over you, and their hands shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Deception, strategy out of context. Jesus said, in context, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And then we have the third one. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. He doesn't come back to the it is written thing because that's not fitting, is it? At all, whatsoever. But he's pulling all the stops out right here because he knows that where we focus, who we worship, that's crucial. Then Jesus said, and I just love this, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Amen. What a powerful thought. Intimacy, fellowship, relationship, overflowing into our doing and our serving. 
Romans 15, four to six says, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning, the Old Testament scriptures, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded towards one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may be, I love this, with one mind and one mouth glorify God and, God and glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then we read 2 Timothy. I wanted to read it again. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. And then this word here, it says for instruction. What that can be rendered as is training. The word of God is training us in godliness and in righteousness. Just as that Roman soldier had to be trained, it's crucially important that we're trained. And I like the word coach. It's just coaching up. The accurate using, dividing, interpreting the Scripture and the Holy Spirit just embedded in all of that. Training in righteousness the breastplate of righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work that he has preordained before the foundations of the world for us to walk in. Sean Huseman's training is different than Michael Kenley's training. Oh, there may be a lot of similarities, but he knows specifically what he's going to do through her, through Mel. We could go around this whole room. It's so incredible to consider that, that good works designed that Dwayne is going to fulfill in and through Christ. All new creations in Christ need training. Training and wisdom and understanding is how to handle the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And that really is what is so powerfully revealed uh, here in this text. And in one sense, this really kind of puts a huge exclamation point on it. Uh, Hebrews 4.12. And notice here, it's not the slashing like we said, it is the piercing. For the Word of God is living and powerful. You guys, you know, it's... <laughs> This, this, in one sense, we could say is an organic book. It is alive. Do you ever read it and all of a sudden it's just like, wow. It's like God speaking directly to you and there's nobody else. Or man, I hope maybe sometimes that might happen on occasion here in the church. That you would go, I was like, I'm the only person in the room. But it's through the power of the living, powerful Word of God. This is unlike any other book. And it's important for us to understand that. That's what I want us to grab today. We may spend time reading a lot of things, right? It can be the comics on Sunday. It can be any number of things. But giving ourselves to read the Word of God is essential for us as new creations in Jesus Christ to stand firm and stand fast in this day, in this age, to the end game that God is glorified and Christ is exalted by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that verse just always rings in my mind. It's living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing to the division of soul and spirit. It's dividing that which is in the spirit, as we said, and that which is of the soul and joints and mirror. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It unveils, it uncovers what are our motivations, what are our intents, what are our directions. It's so important that we be feeding spiritually on the Word of God. And the evil one just wants you to neglect that. Oh, I'll, I'll get to it sometime. 
oh, I, got, I just got this, I got that, I got this. I know. But it's so vital for our spiritual health that we be trusting in dependence upon the Holy Spirit for him to illumine the word of God. And when they do that, you're equipped that when there needs to be a lease to that client, it might not be Leviticus 15, 15, but it could very well be 2 Timothy something. That Rama. That very word from God's word through you by the power of the Holy Spirit that that individual person needs. Isn't that incredible? And it can pierce. And it can accomplish alone what God really desires for it. The word of God is living and active and so vitally important, penetrating spiritually in the unseen, the soul and the, and the spirit, uh, touching a heart. I just wanted to emphasize a couple things before we, we wrap up. You know, Luke chapter 4 really gives us this incredible revelation of the temptation in the, the wilderness with Jesus. He does the same thing. There's reasons that's repeated in there. It's a reason I'm repeating it, you know, uh, right now for us that um, for Jesus to utilize and that to be a part of that armament, the sword of the Spirit, you guys, how much more so should that be for us? I think that's worth pondering. I think sometimes we just run into sometimes circumstances or things and we're not prepared. We haven't taken time to maybe be skilled or trained or whatever it is, however it is. And the Lord Jesus, he really personifies for us this piece of weaponry. I want to use again this quote from Tony Evans. We have an offensive weapon for our warfare against the enemy of our souls, the Word of God, the Bible. When Jesus was tempted by the devil, he gave us an example of how to deal with such an attack. He quoted Scripture to confirm God's way and reject the falsehoods that Satan was trying to implant, where? In his mind. We will never find real victory, we could say rest, in spiritual warfare if we do not take up the sword of the Spirit. Faith cometh by hearing. And what? Hearing by what? The Word of God. We must ever become more familiar with the Word of God so that we will be prepared to use the power of specific passages when the decisive moment arises. Is everybody kind of tracking with me here on the specificity of this, of the, the better exposed we are to the whole counsel of God's Word, the better equipped we're going to be through the Holy Spirit to be able to utilize this incredible weapon of the Word of God? It's a progressive growing, to be sure. But I'm just highlighting it today because I believe the Word is highlighting it for us in this text. I really love here what Tony Evans said, and I, I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to read this because I thought it was so, so great. He said, you might want to write this down, believers need to learn how to have a Bible study with the devil when he attacks. Isn't that great? So when he comes at you and he's throwing those lies and all that stuff, you just say to him, hey, let's just have a little Bible study here together. I love that. That really touched my heart. So when that time comes, we're ready. 
we're prepared. And the Holy Spirit works powerfully through us. God's word is powerful. It's a weapon against our enemy when it's used by the Holy Spirit, his power and direction and dependence upon him, the one who is the third person of the, the Trinity. Offensive, defensive. Uh, the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. Organic, holy, his power. And in the intent of the sword of the Spirit the Word of God is to strengthen us, to encourage us, to enable us to stand and to withstand the evil onslaughts of Satan. What a powerful thought for us. The Holy Spirit uses the Word of God as He works in us and through us to strengthen and to mature and for us to engage with the enemy and stand firm. One man said, the more we know and understand of the Word of God, the more useful we will be in doing the will of God, and the more effective we will be in standing against the enemy of our souls. So that leads us just to wrap up this morning before we um, partake together of the Lord's table. We have this incredible revelation that God has, has given to us which just leads us to this incredible uh, response for us, the, the so what, what's next, we could say. Um, where do we go from here as new creations in Christ with all those things laid down? And I just had uh, a few things I wanted to encourage us in here. The first one is devotion to Christ. 2 Corinthians eleven three. 3. Do not be distracted from simplistic devotion to Jesus Christ. There is so much going on around us, right? Uh, Linda said, I'll see you in the corner. I remember you one time saying shiny, right? It's shiny. So when you see something shine, what do you do? You look over there. And the world is full of shininess. It wants you to look here. It wants you to look there. What the Apostle Paul is saying is just steadfastly look unto Jesus Christ. The race that you're running, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. The second thought is dependence upon the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.16 just simply says this. As new creations in Christ, and Christ lives within us from Galatians 2.20, walk in the Spirit. You won't fulfill the deeds of the flesh, it says. Too many times people start focusing on their fleshly deeds, right? It's like saying, Joanne, whatever you do when you walk out the door, don't look at a pink elephant. Well, I mean, think of a pink elephant. Well, she's going to think of a pink elephant because I said it. What well, Paul says is walk in the Spirit. And then you'll manifest the deeds of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let the Spirit of God be the one who dominates and controls and permeates you. And then the final thought is to be disciplined in the Word of God. Dwayne and Val are a wanna verse. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does, do, does not need to be ashamed. It's diligence rightly dividing the word of truth. So the word of God, written, revealed, read it, study it, meditate upon it, memorize it. I just want to say here, I'm not a big memorizer except just reading over and 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 over. Some people memorize systematically. I do by just pouring, 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 pouring over it. But it's important because then you'll be able to recall it. Believe it. Paul, I thought of our saying. It was God says it, I believe it, that settles it. But I like this one better. God says it, that settles it. I believe it. Isn't that a great way to think of that? And then from that belief, apply it, live it, 
by faith. The Spirit wrote the Word of God. The Spirit wields the Word of God as we live by faith. Tony Evans said, the devil is allergic to the Word of God when it's consistently used against him. You know what I hope to use in the next week and the rest of my life? Two phrases like I've never used them in my life before. Maybe you'll join me in them. One is, thus saith the Lord. And the other one, it is written. So this week, when you find yourself in that moment, just tell the evil one and whatever that influence is, Thus says the Lord, and it is written, and with all surety, it is going to come to pass, just as he said. Well, I wanted to close up today by us celebrating the living word of God as we remember him. So if everybody has one of your little cups or if you need one, you can go uh, grab one and we will finish up just focusing steadfastly upon him. And I'm going to read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, just those uh, first verses from 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken or given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And then I love verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. You know, right in the middle of that message, when I read that section in Revelation, I just wanted to say, come quickly, right now. And so as we celebrate today, we celebrate Jesus Christ. We celebrate his person, his work. We celebrate him to us, him for us, him in us, him through us. We celebrate ourselves as new creations in Jesus Christ who are his, who he wants to work in and through for his glory. And we celebrate him coming again. Sort of a complete salvation celebration is the Lord's table. So let me pray and I'll bless the elements and then we'll partake. Eternal and everlasting Father, we thank you, we praise you for this memorial celebration of Jesus Christ, of him, of his person, his work, its completeness, but also we celebrate. We celebrate the church and this being a lasting ordinance left for us and we celebrate who we are as new creations in Jesus Christ. And we celebrate that not only are we looking unto him as we run the race he's called us to now, but we are looking for him to quickly come and to take us in the rapture of the church. So today is a day of remembrance, a day of celebration, a day of great thanksgiving to Jesus Christ and to him be the glory now and forevermore we pray. Amen. You guys, won't you stand up with me? I don't know if you can navigate these cups real good. I actually just opened mine and I opened to the drink part first. So, um, but I adjusted. So I ended up with a piece of bread. So really a great reminder is Jesus Christ is the bread of life. So, as we eat, let's eat in remembrance of him, the bread of life. And I love how that as we see this cup and as we prepare to partake of it, we're reminded of his shed blood for us on the cross. 
which freely forgives us of all sin and sins, past, present, future, by grace through faith in him. But also it reminds me that the life, as Leviticus says, is in the blood. And so the life of the Lord Jesus Christ is, is pulsating in us and through us. So as we partake, yes, remember. Remember that we're justified by grace through faith as a point. But remember, we are progressively becoming conformed to his image as we live by faith to the glory of God. So let's drink in remembrance of Jesus Christ and the new covenant this symbolizes. Well, thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you for celebrating with us. And I would pray that as we continue running the race, that we'll become increasingly skilled and proficient in this incredible sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. I did want to mention one thing real quick. is on your outline, at the very bottom of your outline, is... Um, I don't know, on a website, I don't know what it is because I don't know these things that good. Whatever's on the bottom of your bulletin, <laughs> just put in your put in whatever those letters and stuff is, and, and push, and it takes you there, uh, whatever that is. But this year, what I have done, it's been one of the greatest things I've done in regards to the Word of God, and so I want to encourage you guys to check this out. Is the Bible reading plan that is in the script, that is in our bulletin or our worship fam connector, and now Andrea is putting on our site, it's broken down by day exactly as our reading is. Now, what I wanted to say is this. So you can just follow along with that reading plan, but also it's read by a man named Tom Dooley. And Tom Dooley was really good friends with Billy Graham. And Tom Dooley was the voice of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association for years. So he does all those voiceovers. I think he's one of the best Bible readers I've ever heard in my life. And what he does before the New Testament reading, before the Old Testament reading, before the Psalms reading, he just gives a brief overview of what you're going to read. And each reading is 20 minutes long, right about, some a little longer, some a little shorter. But he just kind of gives you a brief preview. One of the things he did, just for a quick example, was when it came to the feasts, when we were going through, I think it was Deuteronomy, he just mentioned how each one of those pointed to the person of Christ. So then when he read through that, it was just so powerful and so meaningful. So in the light of the Word of God, I look forward every morning to meeting with Tom Dooley and listen to him reading that text. And I actually read along. And uh, Tom's now with the Lord, but it really is an incredible opportunity. So I just wanted to put that out as a very strong, applicable application, and you can use it in your car, wherever. But I love you guys. Be blessed. Have a great week, and uh, look forward to seeing you next week. We're dismissed, everybody. Mm -hmm.